Hi, my name is Jason Schroer and I am the uh, director of the health practice at HKS Architects. We are headquartered in Dallas, Texas. I am joined today by Jenny Evans, who is the development director uh, and clinical specialist in design, and she's got a nursing background. Today's presentation is supported by the commercial services, the U.S. Embassy Japan, and some of you may recognize the HKS name because we recently have designed the Escon Field Hokkaido. HKS is a global firm whose core business is architecture and design, and we've been in business for more than 80 years. We have many experts in many building types, in particular health, hospitality, and assembly. We knew that we could find some creative ways to help worldwide communities in this time. During the current COVID-19 crisis, HKS convened a series of think tanks to quickly study and discuss alternative care sites for low acuity COVID-19 patients. HKS has experts in many building types, including health, hospitality, public assemblies I just mentioned. And together, because of this expertise, we feel like we are uniquely qualified and positioned to explore alternative building conversion solutions beyond hospitals. HKS is a learning organization and it's in our values to share our ideas. Uh, and today we act as connectors to knowledge and perspective that is also beyond our own. And metaphorically, we're hoping that this is an opportunity to connect each other in a time of separation. As we set the groundwork for the conversation, it starts with the predicted bed shortages in hospitals across the globe. And then we ask the question, which building type, if any, could be quickly convertible to patient care, which led to the conversation first with our hospitality teams. And then we began to investigate if there was the ability to convert schools for patient care. And then finally, we began to look more closely at assembly spaces. Jenny? As, as we were looking at these different types of spaces and considering the patient types, we really came down to the conclusion that the lower acuity patient is the most appropriate for any of these alternate care sites. Uh, even with pediatrics, we felt like pediatrics should be uh, cared for at the hospital because of their special needs and any patient requiring oxygen or increased uh, life support would be best cared for at a hospital. The five patients that we came up were, with were those suspected of being a COVID-19 carrier, uh, perhaps they're positive, but they don't have severe symptoms and just require a little bit of monitoring. Uh, patients that are positive yet live with someone that is high risk for uh, getting the virus, someone that is immunocompromised or has other risk factors, or perhaps the patient lives alone and cannot care for themselves if they're positive or post-hospitalization, and we're, we saw that in the United States, still seeing this in the United States, and we understand that Japan is doing that as well. The flows for the um, patients through these alternate care sites is the same regardless of whether it's a hotel, school, or assembly space. They present to a designated area. The patient would be assessed, tested. Um, they would be held in an area uh, waiting for the test results um, and then triage based on the result of the test. If it's negative, they would go home. Uh, if it's positive, they would have uh, two choices. If they had severe symptoms and, and they were high risk for uh, severe illness, more, requiring a higher acuity of care, then they would be sent to the hospital. If they had milder symptoms or lower risk factors and were positive, they could either go home or they would be sent to an alternate care site where they'd be monitored and cared for until they either recovered and then go home, or if their condition worsened, there would be um, systems set up to transfer them to the hospital. We really believe, and what we saw here in the United States, is that hospitals are looking at alternate locations for assessment and testing of potential COVID-19 patients away from their hospitals and emergency departments. We assume that some form of assessment testing or triage is happening at the alternate care site, and this could be done by drive-through testing or within one of the spaces within the alternate care site building. 
And it's just important to keep in mind about the flow and circulation of the patients um, to limit cross-contamination. Another space that's required in all of the alternate care sites is a command center. It's essential to maintain the operations and organizational efficiency of the facility, and the space must be able to accommodate communication connections to hospitals, municipalities, and other emergency entities. And access to office support equipment, such as computers, copiers, is necessary. In addition, for all the alternate care sites, infection prevention is paramount to continue to further the spread of the virus. Only patients, care providers, and other support staff are permitted in these spaces. Visitors are not permitted. If the spaces have hard surface flooring that's cleanable, that's terrific. If carpet is present um, or time and resources prevent removal, there should be some sort of a barrier put up to separate the carpet from the patient care areas. And so we're thinking that a carpet protection tape is readily available. And then um, after COVID-19, um, the space is used for COVID-19 patients, then we would suggest that the carpet be removed and replaced. In addition, we also have to consider stations for hand washing um, throughout the alternate care site. We looked at this and believe that conversion timeline of 10 to 14 days is possible to bring any and all of these sites up. Uh, to be operational, of course, you have to have partners to negotiate agreements, form teams for implementation and operating, and then prepare the facility by removing furniture and different sorts of things, assessing the Wi-Fi capability, um, looking at technology capabilities, mechanical systems, and so on. And there's also a number of operational considerations to be taken uh, into place in terms of logistics planning, medications, and technology. Probably a medical record, electronic medical record would not be able to be implemented immediately, but um, so the recommendation is to start with a paper chart and then if you're able to move towards an electronic medical record um, later on, that's terrific. So it's you know, difficult but not impossible without time consuming major renovations to convert and renovate an alternate care site. So such conversion would not be practical or quickly done and it would be extremely costly. So these sites can be converted to patient care space that is not quite a hospital. Jason? So let's start with the uh, hotel conversion. Um, we convened you know, a series of think tanks, and this was one of our first think tanks that we worked with our hospitality experts on. And we began to you know, talk about um, you know, what types of hotels would we consider, and what would be the easiest, the easiest to convert. And we came to the conclusion that it would be most likely the best conversion would be a full service convention center hotel, because they predominantly are located in population centers, and they have spaces that are very closely related to those that you'd find in a hospital, including food service, uh, the ability to have on stage, off stage uh, circulation, and flexibility that you could also get out of large ballrooms. They also have, uh, are, are big enough to house between 200 to 500 patients. Um, as I mentioned too, the ballrooms can serve as patient wards, and the idea of open patient wards is a concept that's a thread through really all conversions of all these different building types that we're looking at. And then the number of conference rooms is perfect for the use of things like central medication and supply, a central point of care testing, uh, pharmaceutical supplies, central materials, administrative support and office, offices, nursing support, and huddle and shift uh, change support. The flow is, is, Jenny had described earlier in terms of the triage, we, we could see that, you know, an off-site, uh, off-hospital site uh, testing area for triage and assessment would be easily accommodated at either a hotel drive through or in a parking lot or even a parking garage connected uh, to a hotel. At that time, patients are assessed. They're either held. Um, they can be uh, sent home. Uh, but in the case that tests become negative, they're sent home. In the case that they need to be held and that they're positive, uh, patients would be sent to either a guest room or directly to that ballroom configuration where you'd cohort 
uh, beds and stretchers. As they progress through the care, if things get worse and their condition gets um, uh, worse than it was when they uh, arrived, they may be phased into a different location, which we would recommend that be that ballroom location. And you'll see that theme throughout, but the open configuration of the ballrooms of where the beds are is really a very high efficient use of staff because of their ability to observe more than one patient at a time. And it can also have the ability to cohort equipment. At that point, if patients tend to get uh, uh, progress and get worse, we recommend they go back to the hospital. Uh, if they begin to recover and get better, they can either go back to a guest room or be discharged uh, directly to home. The ballroom configuration, you know, allows for large flexible spaces, the ability to accommodate uh, high weight loads if necessary. It's easy for the ward configuration. We think you can get about uh, one bed per 200 square feet. Uh, it's conducive to efficient staffing. Other support areas uh, are, are easily accommodated and usually adjacent. And the air change rates in ballrooms tend to be um, healthy in terms of air fre uh, fresh air intake. This is a diagram that just shows a cross section through a typical uh, full service uh, convention center hotel where the two, the two uh, ballrooms can be easily be converted to wards. The guest and patient rooms can be converted to patient care. And then in the case where you want to keep staff on site, uh, staff can also use guest rooms to stay on site. This might be a uh, diagram that you might look at for the ground level, entry level uh, of the hotel, where you want to zone things out. Jenny talked a little bit about the idea of trying to minimize cross-contamination. So it's important that early on you begin to discover and identify zones for which you can try to keep uh, cross-traffic uh, in the facility. This is a little bit more detailed diagram. Where it, look, where it shows that you can do a drive-through testing uh, zone here with the drop-off. Patients that need to have further assessment and interviews could be triaged off the lobby, and at which point, uh, if they're determined positive, they can be held uh, and sent to a guest room or sent directly to a ward configuration. This also demonstrates you know, the desire and the need to separate staff supply traffic from patient traffic. So if you remember the diagram before, what's in the blue areas is the staff areas, and then the red zones uh, determine you know, where the COVID patients are. It's also important and part of the reason why these types of hotels can be very conducive to patient care is they typically have uh, more than one set of elevators, one which you can dedicate to patients, others you can dedicate to staff and service. Mm -hmm. These hotels typically have uh, support and service floors. In this case, you know, we're showing the ability to use laundry on site. There's a fair amount of storage for supplies. There's lockers and storage for staff to be able to shower and lock up their belongings. And then this shows a kind of typical ward configuration where you would begin to use the ballrooms to cohort large uh, or, or larger quantities of patients and beds all together. And again, we, we talked about the efficiencies that this can provide, but you also wanna just still keep in mind the idea of the uh, separation between uh, staff and uh, the, the uh, COVID patient areas where you need to be in PPE. And then this would be what would be a typical uh, guest room floor where you convert to patient care. We would uh, recommend that you convert uh, a room or two into workstations for nursing support staff. And additionally, it, it's important that you designate a room or a location for waste. Uh, and then also a centralized room and location for supplies. Uh, additionally, it's probably good to also provide space on the floor for staff break and staff respite. So as we begin to look at schools, you're gonna see some common threads here, but schools are, are relatively unique in that um, you know, they are located in most communities, whereas the hotel type that we just spoke about is, is typically going to be in your high density inner cities. Uh, schools typically are in every community. And so if there is a need to provide additional patient care support space in a community, we really feel like that a school is a good candidate for that. 
A very similar diagram here that we viewed earlier, the idea of triage assessment, uh, the ability to hold patients on site as needed uh, to determine if they need to go home, need to go to the hospital, or if they need to be admitted to this alternate care site where they would be sent to either a classroom configuration or a gymnasium configuration. The other thing to consider in all of these is additional support that may come through mobile units. Uh, one might be the uh, additional need for generators and electrical power support, and another might be that for a re refrigerated truck uh, for post-mortem services. High schools, again, uh, we feel like are a good candidate uh, because they are in every community. They're big enough to usually house between two to 500 COVID patients, depending on the facility. Uh, they typically have wide corridors. Uh, they're designed for adults, unlike the primary care uh, schools. The, the, these uh, high schools are designed for uh, adult-sized people. Um, they typically have centralized MEP systems they have many spaces that are convertible to patient care to support those requirements. And we really feel like there's really minimal intervention here. Uh, it's probably important to note too that uh, the case study that we used for this is much more of a suburban case study where it might be out of the city. Some, we know some schools are in the inner city and they may have elevators and may be more vertical. Uh, in that case, you just need to really assess the site and be sure that the vertical transportation capacity it can handle uh, the type of um, use that we're, we're, we're discussing here. Classroom conversion uh, can be uh, really a, a good alternative. You can typically fit four to six patients in a room. Uh, we would recommend that you remove any non-essential furniture. Uh, you can utilize features in the classroom that already exist, such as infrastructure of telephone, computers, and overhead intercoms. Uh, and additionally, if observation is, is needed beyond what nursing care can provide, you could consider some off-the-shelf Wi-Fi camera solutions. And then the gymnasium configuration. Again, you know, a, a school site offers a, 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 an array of room types and some flexibility. And as typical to the ballroom, we feel like that the gymnasium could be used uh, very easily in ward configurations. This diagram shows uh, a particular school that is uh, a very horizontal uh, oriented school with wings of classrooms. And you know, it, what's unique about this is that you could phase uh, these wings over time uh, if you need to for care as you convert this to patient care uh, facility. The command center uh, is recommended to be centrally located. In this case, we looked at the library uh, location of course, schools typically have food services and cafeterias as well. Um, and they also want to have lockers, gyms, showers uh, that can be used uh, for staff and patients if the adjacencies uh, are appropriate. And this just kind of hones in on a, uh, a classroom wing on how you could convert each classroom into uh, patient care rooms where you cohort beds, again, four to six per room. Uh, lots of staff space, centralized storage space. There's even some outdoor space uh, for both staff and patients uh, to, to, for areas of respite. One-way flow is very important. We uh, want to look at getting patients in in one direction, patients out in another direction, but also uh, supplies in in one direction and waste out in a different direction. And this again is a ballroom kind of gymnasium configuration where we're looking at a large patient ward of 60 to 70 beds. Uh, we also studied the ability to convert a gymnasium uh, by using some prefabricated um, units, which could be designated as uh, higher acuity patients. There's, there's uh, these prefabricated units that can convert to negative pressure. Uh, there is a need for additional power. There's probably also a need for things like air and oxygen as well, but can be um, easily converted in this type of configuration. And then lastly, what if we begin to look at public assembly spaces uh, like convention centers? So again, similar diagram, we would propose that tri triage test and assessment area, uh, the ability to determine whether or not patients need to be held, uh, determine if they go to the hospital directly, 
or if they stay on site, at which time you can begin to designate uh, different pods and different wards for different levels of patients. And then as they progress through the care, uh, they can be sent home. And in cases where they might, their condition might be getting worse, they may be cohorted with other patients uh, whose condition is worsening. Uh, but we would still recommend that those with the worst conditions, particularly those that might need breathing intervention, would be back to the hospital. Large flexible spaces, you know, ample utilities to support the care in these large assembly and convention spaces. Uh, there's convenience for loading docks. You know, it's, it's much easier to bring in prefabricated structures and even tents to the indoors if it makes sense uh, to create kind of uh, contained units for care. Uh, there's large back of house and support areas to maintain that on stage, off stage, and the separation of traffic. Uh, ease of vehicular and transit access, and typically they're very durable materials that are easily to clean. These are some recommendations based on uh, some studies we've done for bed spacing. Uh, as you can see, you know, the, the base recommendation is basically to have one meter clear on all sides of the bed. In the case where you might have a higher acuity patient, we would recommend at least on one side to create a little bit more space for equipment and caregivers, uh, but you can see that there are a multitude of combinations for uh, access and clearances that we'd recommend. This is just a little more detail of how that might be configured in a larger uh, area with the patient uh, care support areas here, either toilets, showers, uh, with the patient beds kind of centrally located, and then the caregivers on the other side where they'd have supplies, storage, and workstations. And this just looks again at a larger configuration when you begin to think about very large, wide open, flexible spaces on how these could be configured. And then as we begin to look at just generally the diagram of how patients you know, might begin to arrive, uh, the idea of an outdoor testing area again can be typically easily accommodated with these facilities because of the large drive and drop off areas. And then you could phase uh, different rooms and different wards uh, over time if you need to flex and grow the number of beds. And again, you have the ability for a large dock areas and that the idea of on stage, off stage, and the separation of traffic uh, can typically be easily accommodated in these configurations. This is a scenario that you begin to look at an arena, again, an arrival scenario to where you could do drive-through testing and begin to assess and triage uh, patients as they come in. And then uh, they can, we can use the uh, event level area for that open ward uh, configuration. And then there are other areas that could be above the bowl that could be used for staff and other zoning. And then a similar configuration for a different uh, type of arena that may have uh, hospitality suite levels. You know, those can be used for a variety of things that can be used for staff sleeping areas, that can be used for staff support, or they could also be used if needed uh, for patient care areas. There are also infrastructure considerations for all these care sites, and we'll go through those generally. Uh, and that, that are important to think about uh, in any conversion. Now, access to toilets, shower sinks could be challenging because these spaces are typically supported by large gang toilet configurations. And depending on the location, the adjacency, planners may need to consider portable toilets, showers as close to patient quarters as possible for easy wayfinding and containment of patients. Another option is to set up some prefabricated patient toilet uh, areas and tents that can be self-contained and sometimes provide options for showers. And if these can be connected properly to domestic water, that is ideal. Toilet use is potentially a source of significant contamination. So toilets should be enclosed. They must be cleaned frequently. Bedside toilets, bedpan use will add to the workload of an already overloaded staff. They also increase the potential for contamination. Uh, so we would recommend uh, shared port a recommendation of shared portable toilets that would be changed multiple times throughout the day. Uh, it will make from a distance from a patient bedside a toilet more reasonable with minimizing more cross-contamination 
of travel. Lighting considerations, lighting in each alternative care site will be unique to the site. Uh, mobile task lighting may be needed to be incorporated for patients to sleep and rest while allowing staff to continue to provide care. And individual patient lighting could also be provided to allow a sense of control for the patient's immediate space. Power considerations and additional electrical distribution should be considered to support an open area function by providing additional power for medical equipment and other necessities for patient care. And depending on the anticipated level of patient acuity, the project should consider provisions for standby power specific to the loads critical to patient care. There are some structural considerations. This will be site by site. Buildings designed for more than 300 people congregating in one area uh, are uprated to type three structures and these will have inherently better resistance to wind events and earthquakes. Uh, though not yet still a hospital, they're still essential facility level. We would suggest that an evacuation plan for tornadoes, typhoons, post earthquake uh, where appropriate be developed. Most one story venues uh, on the lowest level would be slab on grade. However, this does depend on soil types. Regions with expansive soils are, are most likely to have structured floors. Slab on grade can likely carry loads beyond minimum required design loads. Structured floors on the other hand will be limited to the original design loads. And this will all be dependent on the local structural building codes. Air quality considerations. A consideration should be given to patient thermal comfort when located in large open spaces. Uh, the ability to control temperature at exact locations will be limited. And with the COVID symptoms, including fevers and chills, provisions will need to be considered for maintaining patient comfort. Indoor air quality and conditioning are dependent on the level of patient acuity and must be balanced with the cost time and the long-term impact of the facility. The ability to provide negative pressure containment of an airborne COVID-19 droplet in an alternate care site is limited. Based on U.S. healthcare building guidelines, air exchange rates used in hospital and patient rooms are closely aligned with the exchange rates that are typical for hotel ballrooms, convention center ballrooms, and exhibit halls. Classrooms generally have 10 to 12 changes of locally recirculated air and at least three changes of outside exhaust air per hour, which helps to clean the air and will serve patient care area as well. More outside air helps to dilute infectious particles that may be in the room air, providing an advantage to classroom housing patients. Any air quality or provisions will need to be vetted with the regulatory compliance considerations to the extent that the facility is going to be expected to comply with building energy and health care guidelines. Clothing thoughts. These are explorations and they're meant to ask the question, what if? They're to investigate ideas that could be considered when facing a conversion scenario. It must be acknowledged that these studies are far from comprehensive and it does not identify or resolve all of the issues that may arise in any scenario, nor does it consider other building types. And most importantly, there will likely be staffing deficiencies and potential medical equipment shortages. Systems may need to be modified that were not addressed as part of the study. Many of these sites share similar types of programmatic spaces. The difference between space will require individual assessments. This analysis sets the groundwork for deeper dives into these topics, such as will require additional study and consideration. This is an approach that is based on the ability to convert a non-hospital building for the use of patient care very quickly. A hotel, a high school, or public assembly space offers this opportunity. With the right resources and team, a conversion timeline of 10 to 14 days is reasonable. We'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present these ideas on behalf of the Commercial Service, United States of America Department of Commerce, and on behalf of HKS, we thank you for the opportunity to share these ideas. If you need any follow-up, the contact information is on this slide and can be provided in the link for which we're sharing this video. Additionally, we will also provide links to the full studies uh, that you can look at in with a little bit more detail. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. Thanks for your time.